Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. And I hope that you have experienced the Lord as you entered into his, this place of worship. And I'll bet you even experienced him as you were waking up because he is with us, the people of God. And it's good to see all your smiling faces out there. I'd also like to draw your attention to the black pads. If you would please fill those out, our friendship pads, uh, guest or no, everyone, please sign in so that we can get you counted. And if you are a guest among us, we have a gift for you that I'd like to get to you at the close of this service. Um, also announcements are in your bulletin so look at those closely and I would also invite you to uh, specifically look at one that talks a little bit about our small group teachers leaders facilitators Sunday school teachers if you fall into that category and are planning or even considering leading uh, with using the resources for the story that's our upcoming fall campaign I'd like you to come to a meeting that I'm going to have on August the 20th and it's at 7 o'clock here at the church and we will look at the resources and I will put everything into your hands that you will ever need in order to be successful and run a group that will be God-centered and also people people encouraging. So uh, look at that. Uh, again, August. I keep wanting to say October, but it's August 20th. Very good. And having said that, there's other announcements that you can peruse on your own. But let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your inviting presence. We pray that we would not be the same when we leave this place for having encountered you, the living God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, a couple minutes um, for the last three years we have had Brett on the back um, playing drums for us and um, we're very thankful for that he's added a lot to the worship service and this is Brett's last Sunday being with us he leaves for school this week so he won't be with us anymore and we're gonna miss him um, we have somebody um, stepping up to take over for him I believe and so we've got it covered but make sure before you leave today that you thank Brett for all the work that he's done um, I could sign a voucher for him for volunteer hours for a key club or something like that for everything that he's done, but we really appreciate the work that he's done. Let's, let's sing um, Christ is Risen. <laughs>
have so much to celebrate on this Sunday and all Sundays, really. Not just Easter do we celebrate the risen Christ, but all throughout all the year, and especially on Sunday, because you know what? He is here, and because he's here, we celebrate and we worship. But let's try to really focus our, our singing to him today. How excited I am to be here in his house. Hope you all feel that too. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. outcry of our heart for in his presence is fullness of joy and I hope that you experience that this morning let's feel his presence among us as well as see it with the eyes of faith let's enter in joyful joyful
Amen. God is the only one that can take our sins away. You may be seated. Let's pray. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, that you have given us the privilege of participating in what you want to do through our gifts and offerings here in Westfield, Indiana, and also into the world, into all the world. We thank you that we can be a part of your good work, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now if the children will please come forward. Good morning. I got a nice group here this morning. How are you guys? Good. Okay. Does anybody know what that is? It's a whiteboard. And I got a marker, right? Everybody likes markers, right? I like markers anyway. Today we're going to talk about something called sin. Does anybody know what sin is? Do, doing bad stuff. Boy, I'm going to write that down. Anything else? Have you ever said something to someone that maybe yeah. you regret? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Saying things. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Have you ever had somebody take something away from you and you didn't know it or or you've heard of someone that took something? Yeah, you want to come sit up here? Well, yeah, some people do it as adults and they call it, ooh, stealing. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you didn't. Well, you know, God says there's all kinds of sin and there's not really a big sin and a little sin. Sin is sin. Ew. It's medium. It's a medium? Well, medium? It could be. Medium sin. In between. Well, here's what God tells us, though. God tells us that he doesn't like sin, but he's willing to forgive the sinners. So all of us here are sinners, right? We try to be perfect, but we're not perfect. Only God and Jesus is perfect, right? Yep. Yep. So we know we're going to make mistakes every day, right? Do you make any mistakes? Yeah, yeah, me too. Unfortunately, we all do. So there's a really nice thing that happens that Jesus does for us when we ask him to forgive us. I'm going to ask you to do this for me. Can you take the eraser and erase that? Let's see. Oh, yeah, you got to rub a little bit harder. Good. That's good. All the way up. Good job. Okay. Well, as you can see, he did some erasing here, but it's not totally clean, is it? No. Once in a while, Jesus gives us a little extra help. Did you know that? He gives us something that allows us to totally wipe away the sin, and we become white just like the whiteboard again, and so our sins are forgiven. So every day when you come across things that may run in your in interference with what you're doing, I want you to think about what Jesus, what you, he would want you to say and do. Because it's those things that we say and do that sometimes lead us down a sinful path. So for you all, I have a little sack of a reminder. I gave each one of you a chalkboard and some chalk and a little um, book marker to put in your Bible that says, W W J D. What would Jesus do? So every day, I want you to think about if you're playing with that chalkboard, that at the end of the day, if you wipe it clean, that's just like Jesus wiping away your sins. Okay? All right, can we say a prayer together? All right. Can you say it after me? Dear Jesus, we know we sin, and we are so sorry. We ask you to forgive us, and we want to share your love. In your name, amen. Um, uh, as a, one of the things I'm going to be doing in the fall, I'm pretty excited about, is last couple of years we've done a, a, a fall sermon series. Uh, last couple of years, one was like eight weeks and one was like six weeks. I'm really excited about this one in the fall, starting in the fall, because it's 31 
weeks. <laughs> and you're going, oh, no, not 31 weeks. Actually, it's a couple sermons. Uh, there's this book they come out with called The Story. And it's basically the Bible put together in chronological order so that you can read from Genesis to Revelation uh, as one unfolding story of God's plan of redemption for humankind. So um, I'm going to be preaching uh, uh, September 13th on creation. And you can read the chapter on creation. It's just straight from the Bible and uh, with some connecting points to help it flow like a novel. So uh, if you say, well, I want to participate in what's going on this year, number one, you can come to the worship service. That's level one, and you'll hear a teaching uh, on the Bible. Second, if you go, I want to, I kind of want to read along, and it's called The Story, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. You say, you know, I want to, I want to be in a small group this fall. Every small group, there's a a DVD with 10-minute teaching segments and a participant's guide. And that's really all you need is uh, an eagerness to come and hear God's word. If you want to read along, you can get that. And we got a great deal on them. They're normally 15 bucks. We got them for six each. So, um, and then there's even uh, further stuff if you go, I'd like to go deeper. So uh, anyway, uh, it was a little video segment. We're looking forward to uh, what's going to be going on this fall. Uh, You can go ahead. I think. I had found in the past that the Bible can be kind of complicated and then I would get bogged down and I'd get partway through the Old Testament and then it just would fade away and I wouldn't finish it. If you try to read the Bible on your own, it's a little confusing and people can get discouraged or they get stuck. And where do you go for, um, for some sense of coherence? I was looking for a way that would bring people in an excited way back into God's Word. And that's when I began to read the story. And there I found what God wanted us to do. The cool part about the story is it's actually not anyone else's thoughts or ideas, but it literally extracts from the Bible, which I think is better than some man's secondary opinion of the Bible any day. When I read the story for the first time, I thought, wow, this is going to be good because it was just a chronological reading of the scriptures. Sometimes our people lack the sense of understanding the complete narrative, and that's what the story gave us. The job of the story is not to replace the Bible, but to direct you toward the Bible. When we began to look at the story, we realized it was for everybody. It was for our children, it was for our youth, it was for our adults. It's one of the first times that in our church it doesn't feel all the way separate, like your, your demographic is doing your thing, your demographic is doing your thing. And I believe that with more than a quarter of our parishes participating, that we have started a tide that will rejuvenate the way we do church. And so many people today, I think, are looking for their place in life. But when you can look at the story and realize how your story connects with his story, I mean, it's just an incredible epiphany. Now, uh, Linda and Dan Lutz are going to talk a little bit about about, uh, the promotion and also our, our prayer emphasis for the next 40 days. Okay, well, my name is Linda Lutz. And um, I'm part of the team that's going to be promoting the story. And so um, I just want everybody to remember that this is the book that everybody's going to get. It's called The Story, but it's really the Bible um, in order, like they said. And so before, um, you know, we, I got to see the video that you guys saw this morning and right away, that resonated with me. The first lady that spoke, Sandra, um, I could completely relate with that to that, and so I'm going to share that as well. So I'm really going to date myself also. So this is my Bible. My mom gave this to me for Christmas in 1977, and it was The Way. And if you grew up in the 70s, you might have had a Bible that looked like this. It was called The Way. And what was really cool about it is in the front of the Bible, they had this place that said the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you could actually mark off the chapters that you had read. So this is my Bible, and if you, get, you guys can't see it, but up here there's two dates. The first one says March 31st, 
1975. And then this one says, or I think it does because I don't have my glasses on. The next one says, might say 1978, April 5th, 1984. This is the Old Testament. And I got to numbers. It's crossed off. Everything else is blank. I could not get through the Old Testament because as a kid, I thought it would read like a story and I could only get so far. And then, like I said, you get to Deuteronomy number. It's mm, I couldn't get through it. But if I turn to the New Testament, it's all marked. I did manage to get through the New Testament. So I knew it was really important to read the Bible, but I just couldn't get through it. And I couldn't figure it out. And then um, six years ago, somewhere in my 40s, I started disciple class. And again, I'm not here to promote disciple. I'm here to promote the fact that because of that, that was the catalyst for me actually reading the Bible and figuring out how all those 66 books fit together as one big, beautiful love story that Jesus wrote to us. So I would encourage everyone, I'm up here to just basically encourage you to really get on board with reading the story which is nothing more than the Bible written like a book in order so that it's easier for you to understand and that this hopefully will be the catalyst for you. And again, if you, um, you know, just come to church, that's great and, and read it. But I would really encourage you to get into a small group or if your Sunday school is studying it, you know, that's a small group and that's going to be awesome because there is nothing better I have discovered than sitting around reading about the Bible, but then talking about the Bible. That takes it to a whole nother level, and it's an awesome experience. And I cannot wait for our church to participate in, in this study, because I'm hoping not only will it be a catalyst for us, but there'll be chances to invite people to come and experience. And, and I just think it's going to be awesome. So that's the promotion part of this piece. <laughs> It is an exciting time, and I hope all of you will uh, kind of get on board with it and uh, um, read the story and then uh, share it in your, in your Sunday schools and small groups. Uh, one of the things that the uh, pastoral staff and the leaders here at Christ United Methodist are encouraging all of us to do is to, uh, um, and, and there's a handout on your chair when you came in today, but uh, it's called 40 Days of Prayer. So we, we want to bathe this entire experience uh, and our church in your prayers. So. I encourage you to take one of these and then make it part of your daily morning, evening, or both uh, prayers uh, to God for specific items. But the things listed up at the top, we're asking you to pray for every day. And then there's a, a schedule, um, August 2nd through uh, September 10th, 40 days, uh, that'll take you uh, with specific items to pray for in your daily prayer. So I encourage you to take one of these and then stick it in your Bible and make it part of your daily routine. Um, as we're reminded, uh, Jesus was a prayer. He knew the power of prayer. He called out to his Father uh, with prayers and tears on our behalf. And uh, I, I'd encourage you to, uh, to remember that through this whole process. As the, uh, in the New Testament, uh, the, the author of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 5, uh, verses 7 through 9, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. So as you see, Jesus knew the power of prayer, and we need to remember that as well. So please, uh, take this and, and pray daily for our church and for this whole The Story campaign. So thank you. And uh, Dan and Linda all have a little section there on the back called Fasting. And John Wesley said, add fasting to your prayers and you will not pray in vain. Uh, so uh, you might want to read that. And these are just suggestions. If you got anything else, pray about it. Okay, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer during our first day of 40 days of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you allow us to be in relationship with you. And you desire that. We thank you that your eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in everything you've made. And we give you our worship and our praise today. We especially uh, praise you 
because of your great love for us in Jesus Christ and that you came to us and suffered and bled and died on a cross for our redemption and rose again for our justification. And you give us the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and empower us to live for you. And we give you thanks and praise for all of your grace toward us. And Lord, uh, on this uh, prayer list, we see here to pray for the story. We pray about that. Uh, if people have interest, that they would like to do that, that uh, we pray for the fruitful congregation journey that our congregation is, is in right now. We pray f- that you would help us to worship you in spirit and truth to grow together in our Christian faith and to reach out uh, to our community in Westfield and for the redemption of the world. And we give you thanks and praise today. We pray for all those on our healing prayer list. We pray for our nation, for the persecuted church around the world, and uh, uh, for Christ United Methodists and for our Methodist uh, denomination. We pray uh, now the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would, out of reverence for Christ and his holy, holy word, would you please stand as you're able? The first reading today will be from John's 8, 3 to 11, and then we'll move on to Romans 1, 24 to 27. There we go. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Therefore, God gave them... Oh, pardon me, we're moving into Romans. (laughs) Little jump there. Romans, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. You may be seated and thank you for your respectful standing. The Apostle Peter was a fisherman and he was called by Christ to follow him. And Peter responded and left everything and follow Jesus. And Peter was called by Jesus Christ to be a disciple, a follower, a learner, and to be an apostle. And Peter responded with exceptional leadership. But on the night Jesus was betrayed, he failed Christ miserably. Peter denied Christ that he even knew Christ. And when the rooster crowed, Jesus looked right Peter right in the eye, and Peter was ashamed. And he went out and wept 
bitterly. And the Lord Jesus died on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for Peter's sins. And Jesus was buried. But on the third day, Jesus rose again for our justification. He was raised from the dead. He appeared to the women and he said, Go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. Well, when Peter heard this, he was stunned. He called out my name. He still thinks I'm a disciple after I denied him. And he appeared to the disciples several times over a period of 40 days. And he showed himself alive with many convincing proofs. He showed them his nail-pierced hands and feet and his side, which was pierced by a spear. The third time Jesus appeared to them, they were out fishing and they weren't catching anything. And Jesus said, throw your nets over on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. So they said, well, we might as well. And they threw them over and they, they, their net was so full they could hardly bring it in. 153 large fish, what they said. And Peter said, it's the Lord. Peter jumped in the water and went uh, to meet Jesus. And Jesus cooked breakfast for them. And after they ate breakfast, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because this is the third time he asked him, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter has just been restored by Christ to be an apostle and even a leader among the apostles. And three times Peter had denied Christ. And three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter responded three times with yes. And Jesus responded to each yes with a commission. Tend my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And he did. And I come to you as one today who's been called to believe in Christ, to follow Christ, to love Christ, to serve Christ, and to be a preacher and teacher of His Word. But I am an imperfect human being, and I too have failed Christ miserably at times. And I've gone out like Peter to weep bitterly over my inadequacies, faults, and sins. And I've had to call out like the tax collector did and beat upon his breast, Oh God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Christ died for my sins. And Christ rose again for my justification. And he sets me apart for his service. And he says to me, David, your sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord. And then he says to me, David, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And I kind of like Peter with downcast eyes kind of say, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he says to me as one called to preach, Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And so as an act of love for Jesus and love for you, I intend to do that today as best I can in love. And so I ask you as an act of love for Jesus to listen intently. In the last six weeks or so, we've had a few people inquire about our church. And it goes something like this. One person says, we're looking for a church, but before we visit, we want to know where you stand on the marriage issue. Are you for traditional marriage or are you for uh, homosexual marriage because if you're not for traditional marriage we won't even visit your church 
Another person says, we're looking for a church, but before we visit, we want to know where you stand on the marriage issue. Are you only for traditional marriage or are you for homosexual marriage? Because if you're not for full homosexual marriage and inclusion of uh, homosexual persons in your church, then we won't even visit your church. Now, this is a pastoral message this morning on this topic. It's huge in the culture and in the church. And so I will have us examine the scriptures, examine what the United Methodist Book of Discipline says, what's happening in the Methodist church, what may happen at general conference in 10 months. And I want to do talk about it today because for the next 31 weeks, 21 weeks in the Old Testament, 10 in the New Testament, I don't really want to talk about this <laughs> during that time. And, and it'll be in the news and everything. So, so let me approach it from the perspective of this. I have a friend who struggles with homosexuality. Okay, Bill, Dr. Bill Boknai is a leader in the confessing movement in the United Methodist Church, which I'm affiliated. And uh, he served as chaplain in the Army National Guard for 27 years and retired with a rank of Brigadier General. He was on the executive committee of the World Methodist Council, the head of the Epworth Institute, a continuing education uh, institute for UM clergy. And he was the senior minister of Christ United Methodist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And he had uh, publicized his upcoming sermon, which was titled, I Have a Friend Who Struggles with Homosexuality. After a service, a friend stopped him and he said, Brother Bill, I noticed that you're going to be preaching on the topic of homosexuality in the few weeks. I want you to know that I have struggled with this for a number of years. Actually, he said, it's what broke up my first marriage. Broke up my marriage. He said, I've been through lots of pain. Several years ago, I began seriously to seek God's help. He said, I set out to find a church. In one church that I visited, the minister referred to homosexuals in an extremely negative, angry way, calling them names that were hurtful to listen to. He said, I certainly did not feel comfortable there. Then I found another church that was the opposite. The preacher said that the Bible approves all kinds of sexual relationships between consenting adults who care for one another. He said, well, I knew enough of the Bible to know that he was not telling me the truth. I figured if he would not tell me the truth about one part of the Bible, he wouldn't tell me the truth about the other parts of the Bible. So I got out of there. He said, then I found Christ Church. I could tell right away that you are Bible-centered and that you would always tell me the truth. But I also sensed that you wouldn't beat me over the head with the truth. I felt kindness and acceptance here, so this is where I've made my home. By the grace of God, I've been able to live a celibate life, and I feel very fulfilled. Thank you for your hospitality. Well, Dr. Borknight said after that man spoke to him, he had tears in his eyes. And Dr. Bognight went on to say that his words assured me that we were being faithful to our commission. Our task as a church is to oppose sin, but love sinners. We must never pretend that wrong is right, he says. And we must never forget that even the most despicable sinners, like the thief on the cross, are only a whisper of faith away from being a redeemed child of God. Now, during the last 30 years or so, the American culture has been subjected to a major marketing campaign designed to persuade us that homosexuality is a normal and valid lifestyle. The National Gay and Lesbian Journalist Association, made up of writers and editors of the largest media outlets in the nation, including USA Today, Time, Newsweek, the New York Times, TV shows and movies and things like that, ensures regular and positive presentations of the homosexual agenda. And though practicing homosexuals constitute no more than 4%, maybe even uh, like more like 2%, they have enormous influence in our culture. The goal of homosexual activists is social approval and legal endorsement for homosexuality. Their single most important goal is to gain legal recognition for same-sex unions or uh, marriage. And their marketing campaign has been remarkably successful. 
Though they couldn't get it passed through the legislation, now through the courts, it is now legal. The Episcopal Church has ordained a practicing homosexual as a bishop. Newspapers such as the Washington Post and New Orleans Times began running marriage announcements as far back as the early 2000s. And New York City officials established the nation's first high school for homosexual students. Many major American companies had granted marriage benefits to same-sex partnerships for, a long, for some time. And now the Boy Scouts have even not only approved homosexual scouts, but since Monday, now homosexual uh, scout masters. So successful has the marketing campaign been for homosexuality that across America a kind of political correctness prevails that regards any criticism of homosexuality as the equivalent of racism. Now singer and actress Barbara Streisand said, I believe everyone has the right to love and be loved. Nobody on this earth has the right to tell anyone that their love for another human being is morally wrong. Of course, Barbara is not talking about plain love. She's talking about sexual love. And in regard to sex, the Bible has a very clear standard that we must uphold. And that standard is fidelity in marriage between a man and a woman and celibacy in singleness. Now, the homosexual activists have framed the argument that homosexuality is an identity. I'm gay or I'm lesbian. But the Bible doesn't see homosexuality as an identity. The Bible sees homosexuality as a behavior. The Bible is unequivocal on the subject of homosexuality. In your bulletin, I've listed 11 scriptures that have to do with marriage and, the homo and homosexuality. I encourage you to read them in context. The Romans 1, 24 to 27 passage is the single most important of those ten. It is the only passage in the New Testament that tells us why homosexual activity is wrong. Verse 24 begins with the word therefore. It refers back to verse 21 where Paul indicts the wicked for failing to glorify the God they knew. When God is disregarded, man begins to worship himself. And as Paul tells us in verse 25, idolatry is the sin behind homosexuality. Idolatry is the worship of someone or something other than God. And when man worships himself and his own pleasure, sex is deified and perverted. The creation is corrupted. Verse 24 tells us that God gave them over to sexual impurity. This means that God allowed sin to run its course as an act of judgment. And then in verse 26 and 27, Paul mentions lesbianism and homosexuality as particularly graphic examples of how sin distorts God's created order. Paul does not equivocate on homosexuality. Dr. Robert A.J. Gagnon, a professor of New Testament who's written the definitive work in this field, declares that same-sex intercourse is strongly and unequivocally rejected by Scripture because it violates the gendered existence of male and female ordained by God at creation. The United Methodist stance on homosexuality is in accord with the Scripture. And it says this, quote, no homosexual unions can be performed in our churches and no church funds can be given to organizations promoting the acceptance of homosexuality. Self-avowed practicing homosexuals cannot be ordained. At the same time, we United Methodists are committed to support the human, and civil, uh, the human rights and civil liberties of all persons. Believing that all persons are of sacred worth, we're committed to minister to and with all persons. Although we do not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider this practice incompatible with Christian teaching, if you want to write that in your notes, we affirm that God's grace is available to all. Now, having expressed the biblical and United Methodist perspectives on the subjects, I give us uh, five truths for us to think about. Okay, first, number one, all sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman is sinful. 
All ten scriptures relating to homosexuality are opposed to it. Some homosexual activists try to convince us that homosexuality is genetically determined and therefore it must be God's will for those persons. There's no definitive scientific evidence to support such a theory. David Persing, a molecular genetics researcher and a Christian, points to the biblical teaching that all nature is corrupted by sin. And this could include natural tendencies toward various forms of sinful behavior, from alcoholism to heterosexual addiction to homosexuality. Now, when I was early in my ministry at VV United Methodist Church, in our, uh, down by the Ohio River, and uh, there was a guy in our, who attended our church. He was not a Christian yet, but he started attending our church. He was an alcoholic. He had a... He, he, uh, had a degree from Purdue University in engineering, but alcohol had a grip on his life that he was living on government assistance. He'd work in some tobacco fields to get a little extra cash under the table and, and things like that. And, and uh, he said, I may go a week, I may go two weeks without drinking, but then I'll go in a drugstore and get something and there's the alcohol over there and I start to get the shakes and I can't resist it and I get it and I drink it and everything. He called me several times drunk. Finally, he came to me once and said, Can I start an AA group in our church? Would you give your key to an alcoholic to your church? He said, There's a counselor in Madison, and he'll meet with us because he's had some of these struggles and he's trained in it. And so this guy got three or four other guys and met with this guy in our church. He started an Alcoholics Anonymous group in our church, a little small group. What do they do there at AA? A man stands up and says, I'm an alcoholic. I have no power over, over it. I need a higher power's help, and I need your help to help me overcome it. Basically, they do what James 5.16 says. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Bring it out in the open. Confess it, and you'll get power over it. And pray for one another that you might be healed. Only we don't pray to just a nebulous higher power. We pray to Jesus Christ. The group supports people, not that they continue in this addiction, but that they might be overcomers. And this man knew sin, he knew more than most people in the church that sin had power over him. And he needed God's help and he needed other people's help to overcome it. And so we were in ministry to him and with him. Now, we should remember that homosexual orientation or what is not necessarily a sin. The Bible does not condemn homosexual feelings or temptation. Temptation is not a sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. The Bible condemns homosexual practice, the behavior. Now, one thing that has... Uh, kind of bumped homosexual uh, stuff to the side for the time being is this whole transgender thing that's now taken center stage with Bruce Jenner, this Olympic athlete, transitioning from a man supposedly to a woman. By the way, he has not tr transitioned from head to toe yet. And uh, I said on July 12th that, I mean, I feel bad for the guy. I think there's pro I, I think it'd be good for him to bring it out in the open but just not to do what he's doing because I said he's going to tempt young people to follow his example. Now, on Thursday, July 16th, what happened? Okay, on July 16th, on the 11 o'clock news in Indianapolis, they had just given uh, Bruce Jenner the, the Courage Award for coming out and making this transition and everything. And so on the 11 o'clock news, the Indianapolis news said they were talking about people who have transgender uh, issues and they didn't use the word tempt they said Bruce Jenner is inspiring Indianapolis youth to follow and it's inspiring now between 1989 and 1995 Laura and I did quite a bit of youth ministry and we had about a 10th grade boy who was in our youth group and he was fairly troubled come, come from a dysfunctional home uh, didn't fit in with some of the other kids and things like that. And he just kind of blurted out this statement. He goes, when I get out and I graduate, I'm going to transition from a man to a woman. So we kind of listened to him and listened to what he was saying. And here's kind of 
basically what we said to him. I said, I said, you know, Sam, you look like a healthy young male to me. I, I hope you would not do something so drastic. You know, your gender is determined by your biology, not your feelings. Feelings change. Your biology doesn't change unless you manipulate it through surgery, artificial hormones, and cosmetics. You seem like a healthy young male to me. Now here's the second truth. Unrepentant sin has consequences. I don't like the term gay because it is a misnomer. The traditional meaning of the word is light-hearted, jolly, and carefree. But the homosexual lifestyle is usually sad, sickly, and sometimes tragic. According to Bob Davies, executive director of Exodus International, 25 to 33 percent of homosexuals are alcoholics, compared with 7 percent of the general population. Homosexual men are six times more likely than straight men to attempt suicide despite the growing acceptance of homosexual lifestyle. The suicide rate keeps going up. Maybe it's because nobody's offering them hope. Psychiatrist Jerry Stanover in Homosexuality and the Politics of Truth points out that the likelihood of homosexual men contracting HIV is 400 times the likelihood of heterosexual men contracting it. Homosexual persons compose fewer then 4% of the population, of America's population, but account for 80% of all sexually transmitted diseases. Lesbians are six times more likely to be substance abusers than are heterosexual women. A survey in 1991 and 92 found that homosexuals not suffering from AIDS had an average lifespan of 42 years, compared to 70 years or more for the general population. As I said, the homosexual lifestyle is sad, sickly, and sometimes tragic. In my first appointment, about my third year in, a young man came back to our church. He's in his late 20s. He was the son, he was from a leading family in our church, the second child of four. He was the oldest boy. And uh, he worked for the airlines. He came back looking very sickly. He would describe some of his symptoms, having night sweats and things like that. And we're going, wow, that sounds, sounds like, well, pretty soon it came out. He, he had AIDS, you know, and, and he had been in the hospital and I'd visit him several times. And uh, it came out that he had AIDS, 28 years old, dying of AIDS from living a homosexual lifestyle. And our church was stunned. I mean, we were just stunned. But the church responded in love. They took food to the family. When Kenny would come to a, maybe a carry-in dinner, they would hug him. Um, um, I visited him in the hospital many times. And once I, I was visiting Kenny and I said, Kenny, can you, can you uh, tell me where, where are you in your relationship with God right now? And he said, oh, you know, you can't believe in God. You can't believe in the Bible. The Bible's a bunch of myths and fairy tales. Jesus was just a philosopher, and I, I let him rant for a while. And finally, I said to him, Kenny, you're 28 years old. You're dying of AIDS. And God sent me here to tell you that he loves you. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for your sins and mine and for the whole world. And... And, um, and he rose again from the grave for your justification. And if you will repent and believe in him, he will forgive your sins and give you eternal life now and in heaven. Ken, our only hope over the grave is Jesus Christ. Can I pray with you? And he let me pray for him. And he seemed to soften a little bit. I don't really know if he responded or not. Um, a few weeks later... We were having youth group. We had a lot of youth stuff. And the elementary kids, the junior high kids, the high school kids all wrote him cards this night. He's back in the hospital again. They wrote him cards. Ken, we love you. We're praying for you. Hope you get better. You know, all this stuff. And it's 6 o'clock at night. I really don't want to drive an hour and a half to the hospital and back. But I heard he wasn't very good. 
So I drove up to the hospital. His mother's in the room with him. And I bring him the cards. Said the, all the kids in the church wrote you these cards. And I said, uh, um, can we, can we uh, have a prayer together? So we, we prayed together. And his mother read him those cards the rest of the night. And he died that morning. But did he ever respond to Christ? I don't know. But I do know this, that God was reaching out in love to that young man right up to the very end. And I had the privilege of doing his funeral. And here's the third truth. If we repent of sin, God is eager to forgive and transform. God loves people. Practicing homosexuality just as much as he loves any of the rest of us sinners. And God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that all of us sinners could discover forgiveness and salvation. And as the Bible promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God is not the great rubber stamp in the sky who will approve any sinful desire that we consider to be natural. A better metaphor is to view God as the great surgeon with the caveat that He's not here just to do cosmetic surgery. He wants to do deep tissue heart surgery and bring about transformation. And here's the fourth truth. The church's task is to oppose all sin while reaching out in love to all sinners. The church should help build a society that neither persecutes the homosexual person nor promotes homosexual behavior. We should oppose any attempt to make sexual orientation a specially protected class or grant same-sex relationships the status and benefits comparable to marriage or ordain practicing homosexuals as clergy. Our task is always to oppose sin but reach out in love to sinners. In John 8 is the story of a woman caught in the act of adultery. Judgmental religious leaders brought her to Jesus and they wanted our Lord to affirm uh, the penalty required by the Mosaic law, that she be stoned to death. And Jesus said to them, he who's without sin can cast the first stone. And so They all began to leave one by one from the oldest to the youngest. And finally he turned to the woman and said, is no one left to condemn you? And she said, no. And he said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. And at times the church has thrown rocks at homosexuals rather than offer to help. And the church's reputation has been harmed by extremists who call homosexuals crude and hurtful names. And some of the rest of us have, have... ridiculed them privately, told jokes about them, or regarded them with uh, hostility. I know me and my brother, and we were like junior high age, we're calling each other names, kind of had to do with this. And my, day, my dad rebuked us. He said, listen, boys, cut it out. Don't you know some people have problems that you don't understand? And my dad's rebuke uh, kind of was like getting cold water thrown in my face. But it was a wake-up call. And some of us need to maybe repent of our unloving attitudes toward homosexual persons. And that brings us to the final truth. A sinner should see and feel the love of Jesus in us. Now, as a pastor, I've had the honor of listening to three people or so, two young men and one woman who uh, shared kind of their struggles with these types of feelings. Two men, one woman. One, what was the root causes? Well, one was made by one young man, manipulation by older boys, well, you could probably call abuse. Uh, Another one, unfortunate family dysfunction, a woman. What was uh, root cause? Uh, Loneliness and some kind of sticky emotional dependency. Uh, Many women are driven into this through sexual abuse. And so these people are not the church's enemies. They are simply people in need of the church's love and support in order to restore to wholeness their broken sexuality. And so we must speak the truth to all people, but always, as St. Paul reminds us, speaking the truth in love. We must do more than require homosexuals to be celibate. 
We must include these persons in our fellowship, treasuring them as brothers and sisters, praying with them and for them, and letting them be a part of our mutual struggle to grow up into Christ. All of us have a long way to go. Or at least I do. And we must offer hope and help to people who, who are caught up in these lifestyles. And Exodus International is a responsible Christian organization that is active in most American cities, liberating people from homosexuality. Let me tell you about John and Anna Polk. John was formerly a male prostitute and female impersonator. In his book, Every Student's Choice, he wrote, In my past, there were many masks I hid behind to protect myself. John is now married to Anna, a former lesbian with a similar story. And it was her underlying need for love and acceptance that drove her into lesbianism. And she says, until Christian friends reached out to her with genuine friendship, she was stuck in this lifestyle. And, and one thing, many homosexual men are simply men who desire male con companionship, but the relationship has become sexualized. And the healing of the male homosexual will come from genuine male companionship that's not sexualized. And John and Anna are quick to talk about the transforming power of God in their lives. The good news of Christ's love brought them out of homosexuality. And John said, the Lord's transforming power was so evident during our wedding that my mother and stepfather prayed to receive Christ that night. The truth that, that homosexual activists will not accept is that thousands upon thousands of individuals have left, have successfully left the homosexual lifestyle. According to Bill Consiglio, director of Hope Ministries, 40% of homosexuals who seek change move toward full, homo, full heterosexuals with many entering marriage and parenthood. An additional 40% are able to live fulfilling lives as celibate Christian singles. God accepts us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. Now, what's happening in the United Methodist Church? Well, the official position is that we affirm traditional marriage. The unofficial is that the church has been arguing about it for 40 years. Uh, several denominations have split over the issue. The Episcopal Church uh, went the way of full affirmation of homosexual uh, unions and homosexual clergy. And many churches have pulled out of the denominations and lawsuits ranging from 40 to 60 million dollars. Uh, with that. Then there's other denominations such as the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, uh, and they have all went uh, the, uh, for uh, affirming the hom homosexual agenda, and they it split their denominations. Now, we have had problems in the United Methodists with pastors disobeying the discipline performing covenant services for homosexual couples, and then bishops not enforcing the discipline, especially out in the Western jurisdictions. Um, what's likely to happen at the, 2006, at the 2016 General Conference where church law can be changed? My guess is we will vote again 75 to 80% to retain the language in the discipline of traditional marriage. That's my guess. That's, been, that's the way it's been for years. Um, uh, and we'll probably continue to fight about it. However, there is a third way proposal on the table. And the third way proposal, the first one is to let annual conferences decide which way they're going to go on the issue. And the second one is to let pastors have full discretion in whatever they want to do. My guess is these will be defeated as well. But if it passes... It will cause problems. I hope it doesn't happen, but it might happen. You know? So in your 40 days of prayer, you want to remember that. Now, if we do change our stance, our African brothers and sisters will be disenfranchised. The United Methodists in Africa have told us that changing our position would be disastrous for their witness. It will grant the moral high ground to Islam when it comes to to sexuality in the eyes of the Africans. So our brothers and sisters in Africa have asked us not to put them in this kind of position. 
So the question is, are Christians to be change agents in the culture or is the culture changing the church? Now, as we come before the communion table today, uh, Martin Luther said, the law teaches us what we are to do and not to do. The gospel teaches us what God has done and still does for our salvation. The law shows us our sin and the wrath of God. The gospel shows us our Savior and the grace of God. The law must be proclaimed to all people, but especially to impenitent sinners. The gospel must be proclaimed to sinners who are troubled in their minds because of their sins. And the woman caught in adultery today, she was troubled in her mind because of her sins. And the law stands ready to throw stones. Jesus said, he who's without the sin can cast the first stone. And they went away from the oldest to the youngest. And he said to the woman, is no one left to condemn you? He said, she said, no, Lord. And he said, I don't condemn you either. Go and leave your life of sin. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to you today, we thank you for your word which instructs us. And we thank you for your grace. That we've done things we shouldn't have done and we've left undone those things we should have done. But we thank you that through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, you wiped the slate clean. So help us now. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Remember, uh, it was 40 days of prayer started today, so take that home and uh, remember your church in prayer and uh, anything else you need to pray about. Thanks, Brett, for playing the drums for the past several years. So uh, you can come back and greet with us. So go now in the grace, mercy, and love of the Father, the sacrificial death of the Son, and the cleansing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.